Chapter 8. The Badger Returns Humans were in the courtyard between the cages. Some were the Banjiku she'd met, as well as other tiny black men and women who could only be their kin. The remaining humans were slaves. They were placing offerings, fruit, flowers, incense, before the immortals' cages. Apparently, they'd heard nothing outside the gate. They froze in shock when Kadar reached them. No one spoke. At last, the Stormwing Queen unfurled great steel wings, the metal flashing in the light of torches set around the courtyard. So, girl who slew Zane and Bitter Claws, her voice was dry and stern, do you come to taunt my consort and me? The humans went to their knees, bowing to Kadaro until their foreheads touched stone flags. Does every one of you know what I look like? Dane asked the Stormwing. Your face is in our minds, was the icy reply. It is rare that we are bested by one so small and ungifted. The queen turned dark eyes on the prince. Have you come to see what you will inherit, mortal? Do you think to master us? You mean nothing. These others at least know they are slaves and give me fear because they know nothing else. Her mate shifted on his perch, sidling to and fro, never taking his eyes from Dane and Kadar. The female was Barzal Razorwing, Dane remembered, and he was named Habak. I'm not that different from these slaves, Kadar said politely. Perhaps all I know is fear. It seems that way often enough. A pretty reply. The queen spat on the floor by her cage. That is what I think of it. Stormwings, Dane muttered. Anything they do, they have to be disgusting first. How else may we act, mortal? demanded Hebeck, burning eyes fixed on Dane. Our nature is what it is, don't you see? Our very immortality makes us immune to change. Mortal? No, no. The protest came from Tano, the Banjiku who had done most of the talking when Dane first met him and his people. She is a god, or the daughter of a god whose name she does not know. She is no mortal. Nonsense, scoffed Barza. Forgive, forgive, said Tano. But how can Banjiku be wrong about god things? Our tribe was birthed by Lushigui, sister to Kadunka, the world snake, the all-wise. To us it is given to bind men, to beast people, to know gods, and to be slaves. They must think they're gods every day for that last, Dane thought to Zek, who nodded. Nonsense, Barza repeated. Look at her. She is a scrawny, underfed, unattractive spawn of mortal get, a killer of storm wings. Hebeck baited, then settled down. There's evidence of the Banjiku gifts, my dear. I recall hearing about it from the Shigoi. Girl? You know Rakash Moonsword. He sidled across the cage to a perch near the bars, where he had a better view of her. You told him we are here. Yes, sir, Dane replied. Why? Why tell Rakash anything? demanded Hebeck. You hate Stormwings. Suddenly the griffin gave a shuddering, screaming roar, unfurling her wings as far as the confines of her cage would permit. She took a breath, then roared again and again. We must go said a slave urgently. The guards will come any moment to silence her. Follow us, Tano instructed Dane and Kadar, pointing to an open trapdoor. There are tunnels for slaves to work here. We will guide you away, and no one will be the wiser. So the tunnels do come out this far, Kadar muttered. Dane hesitated, wanting to help the griffin. Reaching with her magic to ask the great creature to be quiet, she felt what was in her mind. The griffin was half crazy from imprisonment. Soothing her would take precious time. She could already hear raised voices behind the door at the rear of the courtyard, the guard's entrance that Kadar had mentioned. Dane, come on, hissed Kadar. Dane, Kitten, and the prince raced to the opening and down the ladder that led from it. Last came Tano, who drew the door shut and threw the bolt. A gnarled finger to his lips, he grabbed a lantern on the floor. Already the others were gone. They followed their guide down a long, winding corridor for nearly sixty feet, where it branched in three different directions. Each one was marked with pictures in softly glowing paint. A bucket on one, a tree of brooms on another, and a horse's head on the third. That was the one chosen by their guide. "'What were you doing?' Kadar demanded softly. "'You know you aren't supposed to be in that area unless you work there, and even then only during the day.' The old Banjiku replied, we worship captive gods. Worship, sputtered the prince. 
Tano stopped and looked up at the tall young man. Worship, he said firmly. Some day they will no longer be caged, young master. When they are free, will not their anger be terrible? Better to make offerings now, so the Grey Ones will remember not all men are jailers. Dane shivered. His words had sounded much like a prophecy. They aren't gods, argued Kadar. Now they passed down their stairs out of the tunnel, each marked with a picture. They can be killed. That means they're not gods. No more is your master a god, nobility, Tano said cheerfully, but he wants offerings from all. When black god claims us, who will be punished for giving worship and power to a false god? The prince or Banjiku? Now, he stopped by a ladder marked by an image of a flower in a fountain. Go up here and you will be in the garden of guests, where lady stays. I'm not a lady, she said, offering her hand. Just Dane. Thank you, Tano. He took her hand in his calloused ones. We are friends of the people together. Kadar had gone ahead and was holding the trap door open. There's no one about. Come on. Impulsively, she leaned down and kissed the little man on the cheek, then followed the prince. They emerged between two hedges. The guest quarters shimmered whitely nearby. Once Kadar shut the trap door behind him, it looked like part of the gravel walk. There was a small bird path next to it. Dane suspected it was there so the gardeners might find the door again. Are there tunnels just under the gardens? she asked. There are tunnels everywhere under the palace, he replied. Mostly used by slaves, but others find them handy, too. They fell silent, enjoying the cool evening. Kadar moved first, stretching his arms. We're in trouble, Dane. All Karthik is. See that? He pointed at the sky. Dane looked up. Stars spilled everywhere overhead. The moon was a sliver. Another night or two, and it would be full dark. The dark moon, for the working of dark magics, she thought, and shivered. See what? Stars? You shouldn't see them. This time of year, the sky should be thick with cloud. Maybe an opening or two, but not clear skies, night after night. We've had very little rain. In the south, people starve while my uncle readies for another war, so he can waste taxes, food, slaves, men. He looked at her and smiled bitterly. You were too God's blessed easy to talk to, Verladane. You watch me with those big eyes, just listening, and the words drop off my wagging tongue. He shook his head and offered an arm. I better escort you to your room. It's getting late. She rested a palm on his arm and looked away as he led her inside. She wished he hadn't found her easy to talk to. There was nothing she could do to help a Carthagy human friend. He wasn't a mongoose or giraffe. She couldn't give the Emperor's heir any waking dreams. In her dreams, she stood with Kitten and the graveyard hag at a crossroads in the middle of a barren land and argued. An audience of rats and hyenas looked on. The graveyard hag wanted her to go left into a fenced-in graveyard where the tombstones leaned at strange angles and human bones poked through the earth. Dane wanted to go right, where she could see dinosaur skeletons embedded in the ground. Kitten, chattering furiously, wanted Dane to go back the way she had come. She slashed at the old woman's legs with a forepaw. Enough, dragon, the graveyard hag said. I can't stop your coming here, but I don't need to put up with your impertinence either. You aren't near old enough to do battle with me. She smacked Kitten on the muzzle with her gnarled stick, and the dragon's jaws snapped shut. She pawed at her mouth, but it remained closed. You stop doing that to her, and stop pushing me around, Dane told the goddess flatly. I'm not one of yours, and I'm getting tired of your playing with me and my friends. The graveyard hag grinned, showing all five teeth. You're a sassy one, dearie, she said with approval. Well, I always did like a girl who could stand up for herself. But you're being naughty all the same. Come into my little garden here and play. Hands on hips, Dane shook her head. By the time you bury two-leggers, they're glad to rest, she retorted. I don't want to play with them. They've earned the right to be let alone. Look at the way you've left them, all higgledy-piggledy like that. I should think you'd have the decency to straighten up around here. Part of her mind knew all this was a dream, but what on earth were they talking about anyway? It made no sense. A gnarled hand that had been empty suddenly boasted a silver dice cup. The hag rattled it, her one good eye twinkling cheerfully at Dane. Toss you for it. No, 
You cheat. Come on, kid. They marched toward the dinosaur bones. At first, the going was hard. It took all Dane's might to lift her legs, and she could tell the kitten was having equal trouble. The girl clutched the heavy silver claw around her throat. It dug into her palm, drawing blood, and suddenly she was moving forward along the barren dirt road. Then she slowed, frowning. Things were changing, as they did in dreams. The dirt under her bare toes felt like cold marble, polished smooth. The blackened hills and barren trees of the orange-lit worlds around her were fading, becoming shadows that hinted at great shapes within. Dane opened her eyes. She was not in her guest bedroom with its luxuriant bedclothes and sweet-smelling wood. Though she still wore her nightgown, cold stone under her bare feet was much too real to be a dream, and the draft that flowed against her back made her shiver. Kitten was dragging on the hem of her nightgown, chattering softly with anger and fear. Kit? Dane asked, kneeling to cuddle the dragon. I'm sorry, did I sleepwalk? She'd never done so before, but things had been too strange during this journey for her to be much surprised. She changed her eyes to those of a cat, thinking she'd wandered out into the common room, or even the hall. They were in the Hall of Bones. What in the name of the great goddess? She breathed. How did we get in without the spell to open the lock? Kit, did you open it? The dragon shook her head. Crazy as it seemed, Dane had a very good idea of how they'd gotten here. When I get hold of her, I will snatch what hair she's got left, she growled. That's it for toying with me. Turning to leave the hall, she stumbled and went down. Throwing her hands to catch herself, she struck the thing that had tripped her, the stand for the mountain runner nest. One hand plunged in among the eggs. There was a blinding flash, one that etched in lightning both the baby dinosaurs standing by the nest and the eggs. She heard a distressed shriek from Kitten, but lacked the strength to tell her dragon that she was just fine, just a little tired. She fainted before her body crumpled. She and Kitten walked a trail that led up a densely forested hill. Suddenly the girl felt better than she had for days. Surrounding her was a northern woods, the air scented with pine, leaves turning color. The day was fading, but even so, everything she looked at seemed extra clear. An owl called. In the distance, a wolf sang the first song of the night. All around she heard small woodland creatures prepare to go to bed, or to start their night's foraging. The peace around them seemed to cow the dragon. Staring at everything, she walked so close that Dane nearly tripped over her several times. Ahead was a thatched cottage, its white plaster walls gleaming as the night drew down. Light poured from the open door and windows. On the threshold, a man with antlers rooted in his curly hair argued with a badger. She heard them clearly, though she was only halfway up the hill. I ask you to keep an eye on her, keep her safe, and you allow my child to be used in that. Flatten your fur, Wirin, replied the badger. What makes you think I had any choice? The great ones can find another instrument. Why didn't you tell them so? I did tell them, you horn-headed idiot. They didn't listen. She didn't listen. If you have a complaint, you take it up with the graveyard hag. A woman appeared in the doorway behind the horned man, drawing her hands on a cloth. She was graceful and solidly built, firelight from indoors gleaming on her pinned-up golden hair. Wherein, does the badger want to sup with us? We... Looking past the man's shoulder, she caught her breath. One hand went to her cheek. Man and Badger turned to see what had gotten her attention. Weirin pointed at Dane. There! You said she would be fine, and here she is. You know what that means? You never should have left her there. If you were so interested in fathering, you shouldn't have put her in my care. She's old enough to get into her own tangles, whether you like it or not. The Badger sighed. I'll take them back. Talk to the Grey Ones if you want, but I think it's too late. Can't you feel things moving forward? He trundled down the path toward Dane and Kitten. This place isn't for you. Turn around. Badger, that's my ma, she protested. And my da? Yes, yes, you should listen when the Bajuku tell you things. Turn around. She obeyed and fell into a mass of rolling gray clouds. When she opened her eyes, she was flat on her back. The badger stood on her chest, claws digging into her shoulders. Idiot Kit! He snarled. You drained your life force for this. You're supposed to use a spark, just a spark, to wake them up. She blinked dazedly at him. How was I to know that, pray? 
You didn't tell me anything. You just breathed on me and left. Nonsense. Of course I told you. Dane shook her head. No? The badger climbed off her. Then I lost my temper at being used to place this on you. I should have taken time to explain. It was a grievous mistake, and it's a service to you. Kitten, much vexed, chattered at the badger, punctuating what she had to say with ear-splitting whistles. Dane groaned and covered her ears while the animal god turned on the immortal. When I wish for your opinions, Dragonling, I will ask for them. Silence. Kitten subsided, muttering under her breath. Dane sat up. Kitten was there with me, she said, frowning. Of course, the badger said. Dragons go where they will, even the young ones. He snorted rudely. <laughs> Pesky, interfering creatures. Kitten made an equally rude noise in reply. Dane heard a rapid clicking, as if something bony ran on the marble tiles. Instantly, she checked the mountain runner nest. Not only was the standing skeleton gone, but the eggs had hatched. That is why it killed you, said the badger, peering at the nest. You woke them all. What were you thinking of? The energy to spark this waking magic has to come from wild magic. Waking the whole nest drained you. You'd better find a way to draw the spark from other sources. I can't bring you back from the divine realms whenever you make a mistake and die. Die? But I thought humans go to the black god's realm when they die. Humans do. You will have a choice, the black god's kingdom or the home of your father when the time comes. You must be careful not- What do you lot want? His question confused Dane until she noticed the mountain runner skeletons to her left, the ones from the nest. Seven of them were only a foot tall. The last was the 18-inch skeleton. All watched the badger, the tilt of their small skulls giving them an odd look of attentiveness. Oh no, she whispered and covered her face with her hands. However do I explain this? Badger, I can't be going about waking up dead creatures. I'm no god. No, but the graveyard had granted you this power to further her own ends, he retorted. I am sorry, my kid. I was not given a choice. She can push you around? And Karthik, which is her own, she can do whatever she pleases. Here she is one of the great gods. In Tortal you would be safe, he snarled. We would be safe from her. She is only a minor goddess anywhere but the Empire. Here, Bright Mithros, the threefold goddess, all but the black god must bow to her. And she is the black god's daughter. In Karthiki matters, he listens to her. Lovely, Dane grumbled. The boss god of all Karthik wants me to get in hot water. Next time I get the notion to travel, I'll remember this and stay at home. She sighed and looked at the mountain runner skeletons. One, braver or more foolish than the rest, had crept forward and reached out to touch the badger's coat. Don't you dare, snarled the badger. The mountain runner leaped back and tripped on its bony tail. Kitten rushed over to place herself between the downed lizard and the badger, scolding loudly, the color in her scales turning pink. Kit, hush! He didn't mean to frighten the little one. Someone will hear. Please be quiet. The badger sighed. It is time for me to go, and for you to return to your room. To Kitten, he said, If you do not behave, I will tell your family that Dane is spoiling you, and that they had better take you from her care if they do not wish you to be ruined for life. Kitten shut up with a last cheep. Dane hid a smile. Looking at the mountain runners, she said, But what about them? I can't hide these, and I've no idea of when they'll go back to sleep. The lizard bird I woke at Master Lindell's was still up and about when we left. The badger scratched an ear. Most of those you wake will sleep when the graveyard hag's need, whatever it is, ends. Only a few will care to stay when their kind and their world are gone. As for these, he eyed them. They had crept around Kitten and were stroking his fur with gentle forepaws. They will go with me. It is the least I can do. I made a mistake, not helping you to understand what you can now cause. Badger, do all gods make mistakes? He glared at her. Rarely. I have not made one in ten centuries, so perhaps I was due. Even the greatest gods err now and again. When they do, the results are catastrophic. He looked at the dinosaur skeletons looming in the shadows. 
their world ended through a god's mistake. Horse lords, whispered the girl, eyes wide. The badger looked at the mountain runners. Climb on, and no pulling my fur. The mountain runners lost no time in obeying. Clustered on the god's broad back, they reminded Dane of nothing so much as little children on a boating holiday. Badger, does it hurt them to die again? Or if a mage blasted them, say? How could it hurt flesh that is not there? This awakening you give them is not true life. When they sleep again, they will return to the other world that serves the spirits of the people. Now go back to bed, he advised, and tell the Banjiku that Lushigoi never meant for them to be slaves. Silvery light bloomed. It winked out, and Dane and Kitten were alone. As they sneaked back to Dane's room, the girl began to yawn. Her body ached as though she had been pummeled. Gently moving Zek from the center of the bed to the side, she got in next to him. Kitten gave a small croak, and the lamps went out. Dane's last thought was of moving her feet to make room for the dragon, and then she slept. The odd night she'd had didn't cause her to sleep late, but as she cleaned her face and teeth, dressed and brushed her hair, she felt as if a griffin had landed on her. Kitten roused as she buttoned her shirt and uttered a forlorn cheep. No, don't, the girl said, voice gravelly. One of us ought to rest. Kitten nodded agreement and went back to sleep. Zek, curled up on Dane's pillow, sat up. You vanished, he said. Kitten got angry and vanished, too. Why didn't you take me? Dane smiled. I didn't know I was going anywhere, Zek, or I would have taken you. Remember, I promise you'd be safe from now on. I won't leave you behind. Now go back to sleep. Ever agreeable, the marmoset obeyed. Closing her eyes, Dane reached with her magic for the Emperor's birds. She wanted to check their progress. The moment she found them, she knew something was wrong. Each appeared in her magical vision as a tiny ball of light. On a handful, shadows dimmed their fire. Some of the birds were falling sick in the same way as they had before. Leaving a note in the common room, she trotted along the shortcut to the aviary, frowning. In conversation with Lyndall the previous day, she had learned he would never change the birds' feed without an excellent reason. He had also said that the Emperor was too good with birds to meddle with their diet when they had been sick and she believed him. Then why were they ill again, and how long would it be until the disease spread to the entire flock? When she reached the door in the glass wall, she saw emerald fire around its edges. Gingerly, she touched the knob. If the magic was to foil intruders, it failed. She felt nothing. She went in and closed the door quietly. When she turned away from it, an oval patch of emerald fire hung in the air before her. It rippled. The face of the Emperor Mage appeared. He was bare of all makeup save for the black paint around his eyes, with only a few gilded braids in his casual hairstyle. Verla Dane, good morning, he said. I thought it might be you. Will you come to my table? I'm by the door into the palace. She scuffed a shoe against the ground, not wanting to say why she was there until she had a better idea of what was wrong. Could I look at the birds first, please, your Imperial Majesty? They need me to check them over a bit, now they've had a couple days free of the sickness. To excuse herself the half-lie, she crossed her fingers behind her back, where he couldn't see. Far be it for me to come between you and your charges. His smile was sweet, if a bit melancholy. You will come to see me, though, once you have spoken with them. She didn't want to, but there was no graceful way to refuse. Yes, sir. Very good. The image faded, the fiery oval collapsed on itself and vanished. Parrot finches came to lead her up the curved stairs to a pair of stricken birds, red-crested cardinals. They clung side by side to a branch well away from the sun, blinking. She saw no signs of trembling, and their eyes were bright, but she could feel the illness starting to work in their bodies. She gathered the mail into her hands. "'What have you been into?' she asked silently so that the Emperor wouldn't hear. "'What have you been eating or drinking to make you sick again?' The bird looked at her dully. He couldn't remember. He was fine the day before, visiting all his favorite places, and he wasn't sick, precisely, just a bit off his feed. She opened her mind to his. The illness showed his black threads running along the bird's nerves, growing toward his spine and brain. Once they reached those, he would know he was sick. She bore down with healing fire, burning out every thready trace. When he was well, she opened her eyes to find he'd marked her arms and feet with thick white droppings. She frowned. 
The first night she'd first come to the aviary, her mind was too full of the things she had seen and the work she was doing for the bird's dung to register as anything more than the reason for the loss of a pretty outfit. Now she scooped up a bit and rubbed it in her fingers. It was heavy, almost paste-like. What it should have been was compact, wet, dark, with perhaps a few undigested seed holes mixed in. The female red-crested cardinal had the same kind of droppings. Dane spread her power through the aviary, calling the other three whose new illness she had detected, a green and gold tanager, an orange-bellied leaf bird, and one of the royal bluebirds with its impossibly blue wings and tail feathers. All three nested close to the glass wall. All three of them emptied themselves of heavy white droppings as she healed them. She held them away to spare her clothes more damage. With them taken care of, she summoned the red crested cardinals back to her. All five of her patients clustered on branches around her at the topmost level of the stair, looking at her curiously. Where do you nest? she asked the cardinals. The male flew to the tree where he lived and back. Like the others, he nested by the glass. Some kind of magic gone awry in the windows? she wondered. Getting her handkerchief, she scrubbed her hands with it as she thought, glass splinters falling into the nest to the food? she wondered, but that wasn't right. If splinters had caused the damage, the bird's dung would be bloody and black, not white. White paste. Why did she think there was something important about white paste? A picture came to life in her memory of Numa making paints using... Lead compounds, she thought, eyes lighting up. They're getting lead. That's what's coming out of their bodies when I heal them. Tell me what you eat here, she ordered. Red-faced parrot finches had come to watch everything she'd done, fascinated. Now they chorused. Seeds. What kind of seeds, she asked. What do they look like? Show me. All the birds came to shower her with images of seeds. Enough, she ordered when they began to repeat themselves. Only seeds, or is there other food? Fruit, said the tanagers. Figs, grapes, fluffy leaves with plenty of wet in them. Dane smiled, recognizing the image of lettuce in their minds. What else? Sometimes green food, said a parrot finch, perching on Dane's shoulder. It's good. It's different. His red face twisted up to hers. They had green food, he said, meaning Dane's patience. So what is it? she asked. What kind of plant? Not a plant, exactly, the helpful parent Finch said. He gave up trying to see her face from her shoulder and perched on her hand. Not a plant. Green seed? she asked. No, said the parent Finch. It is green food. Over here. He fluttered up into the air and darted at the glass. She was about to warn him not to hit it when he stopped, clinging to a vine-like tendril. It was a decoration on one of the metal strips that held the glass panes there. He pecked at the green enamel surface. Goddess bless, she whispered. She reshaped her eyes and face to give herself a hawk's vision and focused on the metal strips near the parrot finch. With so much extra visual power, she noticed a glassy surface on the enamel that was clear, a layer that had to be lacquer of some kind. Cracks ran through it like fractures in ice, and tiny bits had flaked off, revealing the less shiny green enamel underneath. Everywhere she looked, the clear surface was pitted. In a number of locations, the damage to the clear lacquer was even greater, and there were pox in the green material itself. She would know the distinctive marks of beaks and claws anywhere. Is that what you've been eating? She asked her patients, remembering to do it silently. It's good, replied the green and gold tanager, cocking his head at her. It tastes different. I'm always thirsty after the green food, but I still like it. The others chorused agreement. Dane put her hands on her hips. Salt in the enamel, she thought with disgust, only they're eating lead along with it. She called the birds to her, even those begging tidbits from Osorn. Now listen to me, she told them when they were quiet. The green food is killing you. It's poison. You have to promise me you'll never, ever touch it again. As she spoke, she pressed down, reinforcing her words with magic so that they would avoid the stuff forever. I still have to tell the Emperor to have the coatings changed, she thought as she trotted gleefully down the stairs. Or new strips put in, or something. I found out what made them sick, she said when she found him. He was seated in the area with a marble bench, a seed-filled bowl at his side. A table and two chairs had been placed there, and breakfast was already laid out. 
The enamel on the metal things that hold up the glass? They're eating it for the salt and taking in lead. If you change the paint or cover it with something that won't crack or break, they won't get sick again. I've talked to your birds. They were coming back to him now, perching on his shoulders and on nearby branches as he offered them food from the bowl. And they won't go near it anymore. I made sure of that. But you'll have to fix it before any chicks hatch, because doubtless I won't be here to make them leave a bee. He smiled up at her, holding seed-filled palms steady as birds perched and ate. You have done me a tremendous service, fair the Dane. Will you do me another and take breakfast with me? She looked at the table, set with filled crystal goblets, delicate porcelain and silver, then looked down at herself and blushed. Your Imperial Majesty, I'm a mess. It would hardly be fitting. With a gentle movement, he dislodged the birds and moved the bowl away so that they could sit on the rim and stuff themselves. He closed a hand and opened it to reveal a ball of green fire. We require a wash basin and those things necessary for the cleansing of hands. Also a robe, blue or lilac, blue-gray, suitable for a young lady who stands as high as our chin. He closed his hand and the fire was gone. Looking up at Dane, he smiled wistfully. Please accept. I just like meals taken alone, and it seems, of late, I am not the most sought out of companions. What could she say to that? Thank you, Your Imperial Majesty. Three slaves came through an arch, partly shielded by greenery. One carried a gold basin that steamed faintly, another soap, a washcloth, and a neatly folded towel on a tray, and a third something lilac and very fine draped over his arm. Our rooms open into this aviary, explained Osorn. She noticed that he'd switched instantly to the imperial we on the arrival of the others. Our birds will not come there. It is too bright and noisy for them, but we enjoy the sound of the aviary fountains at night. The slave with the basin knelt on one knee before Dane, holding it above his head like an offering. She stepped back, confused. Go on, said the emperor. Wash. She was supposed to clean her grimy hands this way? With a human washstand? The slave with the tray set it on one of the chairs. She and her companion proceeded to delicately unbutton Dane's cuffs and roll her sleeves above the elbow. The girl gritted her teeth, and did as she was expected to, wetting her hands and scrubbing them. With the best intentions in the world, she couldn't avoid splashing the boy underneath the basin. When she was finished, the slaves dried her hands and helped her into the lilac robe. She winced as it closed around her dung-streaked clothing. The garment, a finely made thing with silver braid and tiny pearls worked around hem, collar, and cuffs, would never be the same. Once she was covered, the slaves served the food as Dane and the Emperor each took a chair. When they were done, Osorn dismissed them. I find mutes make the best slaves, he remarked, curling one hand around a crystal goblet. Dane had one just like it before her, filled with something that was the bright red of fresh blood. They do not chatter. Shall we have a toast, then? Dane stared at him, hands tucked into her lap. A toast, your imperial majesty? He raised his goblet. To birds, he said gravely. Relief filled her. She had feared he'd want to toast Karthik, or the ruin of Tortle. Don't be silly, she scolded herself as she raised her goblet. He wouldn't try to make me do something bad like that, not when I just helped him. She sipped the red liquid. It was pomegranate juice, a bit thick and oversweet. She would have preferred to water it down, but the Emperor drank all of his straight down. Good manners dictated that she did the same. When the goblet was empty, she drank from another filled with cold water to rinse the heaviness out of her mouth. What do you think of the progress being made in the peace talks? he asked, delicately cutting a piece of ham. Have you been kept abreast of what transpires here? She fiddled with the napkin she'd put on her lap. I know it's not going very well. No. It was too much to hope for, really, with so much else taking place. All these dark omens. Do you know why the gods are angry? The girl shook her head. It was much too hot in here. Sweat was trickling down her temples, and it was a little hard to follow what he was saying. It also didn't seem like the time to mention that she had some idea of the source of the gods' displeasure. I let a threat to Karthik exist. A powerful criminal, sheltered by my enemy, Jonathan of Tortle. The gods do not love a ruler who permits a threat to survive. It was made clear to me the night of the naval review. So now himself pointed out my error, and suddenly I understood. She took a deep breath. It was an effort to draw air in. He pointed to you, she whispered. 
Osborne smiled, was amused and pitying. Not to me, Vera Ladane, to the criminal, to Aram Draper, your teacher, Numa Solomon. I knew that I was moved to allow his return for a good reason. My hand was guided by the gods themselves. Rising, he came to her side of the table and lifted one of her arms, placing his fingertips over her pulse. She tried to yank away, but all she could think of was Numer. You cannot fight, Dream Rose, Ozorn remarked. It's a cousin of Wakeflower, and very strong. A spear dipped in it will drop a charging elephant. Frankly, I am amazed you are still awake. You can't hurt us. She fought hard to say it. Ambassadors, sacred. I will hurt no one, my dear. He placed her arm in her lap again and brought his chair close, sitting where he could watch her face. You will run away and vanish into the kingdom. I will be furious. For all I know, you are among criminals in the underground, urging them to rebel against me. Your friends will be forced to leave immediately, under guard. Even Tortle's allies will be able to see that these talks failed due to you, not to me. I will have my Tortle in war, and no one will stop me. Better. I know that he loves you, the traitor Solomon. That I could see when he came here seeking you, and the knights are now pointed him out to me, the night the traitor warned my heir not to trifle with you. Since we will go to war in any case, Solomon will return for you, and I will have him. There was nothing in his voice or eyes but kind interest. This will turn out for the best. I like you, Fair the Dane, the way you have of my darlings. He shook his head admiringly. You will have a title, countess, perhaps, even duchess. You will have your own estates, your own slaves, whatever you wish. You will even have the dragon, too. It will be necessary to keep her under the sleep until you are well settled here, but once you are, she will be content as long as you are content. I will not risk waking her until I am certain she will not turn on me. Sleep was wrapping around her like a cloud-filled blanket. Numer... Osorn stood. He dies, my dear. The gods demand a blood sacrifice. And so do I.